Welcome. <laughs> few announcements here. Ad board is the 17th of March. Lenten Bible study continues every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. here in the social hall with uh, social distance seating. Um, bring your Bible, and uh, this next week we are doing 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 25.1. Just the first verse of chapter 25. Uh, that takes us to the death of Samuel. Uh, Ask the Pastor Sunday, also more popularly known as Stump the Pastor Sunday, <laughs> is April 11th. So if you have any questions on uh, church history, church doctrine, church whatever, if any scriptures that have confused you over time, um, any theology that you're wondering about, uh, get those questions to me as soon as you can so I can work on them for that sermon. If I don't get any questions, it means I don't have to preach. <laughs> Y'all look like you don't believe me. <laughs> Do we have any other announcements? Pastor, we're doing the Easter egg hunt this year, April 3rd. Yes, thank you. Easter egg hunt is, is tentatively scheduled based on you know what yeah. will be allowed. Uh, but our plan is not to even do the giveaway in the social hall, but outside in the parking lot like we did trunk or treat April 3rd, yeah. on April 3rd. So, well, we're still going to hide the eggs in the park. Yes. But I'm thinking that Sherry's idea and my mother's idea was a great brainstorm to have the cars park over there. Yep. Oh, I see, right. Because nobody's going to be open anyway on yep. Saturday. And just have the kids come to the vehicle and take the stuff kind of like they did for or three. Yeah. That way, not everyone is touching everything. I think that's a safer method. Yep. So um, I'm going to brainstorm this more with Sherry. So. Okay. I wonder if we can convince the village to cordon off that area. They do it. They do it for the car show. Yeah. yeah. So why not? And they also didn't we have uh, Jeff Heckler or one of the guys from the Bible Project or something like that? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. We've had them. Yeah. And now they won't have to do that because it'll all be over there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll check into it after. <clears throat> okay. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? All right. Then let us join together in singing hymn number 334, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Since we're going with the music, it's only one time through. I recommend looking on the disc from now on. I don't know if those numbers got messed up or something. Or... Number three, three, four. Yeah, And if you're my wife, your response is, but not with a blind. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. 
on each face. And I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for the in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place we would be perfectly we would be perfectly happy if our path were faultless if we were always in step with God, this, this is, is my commandment, commandment that, that you love one, one another. God has given us commandments that we may live as effectively as possible. With our eyes fixed on doing the right thing, we shall never be put to shame. You are to love one another in the same way God has loved you. O oh Lord, touch our lips with your saving grace that our lives may declare your praise. And hymn number 732, Come We That Love the Lord. How are you? There you go. joys or concerns today? I would like prayers for my daughter. Okay. She's having a really rough time with her second COVID shot. Okay. And I know I mentioned it back here. Um, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. Okay. The thing that concerns me the most is she's having a lot of job pain. Mm, okay. And she's been to the doctor, she's been to the dentist, they can't find anything. So I just don't understand. I'm very concerned about the patient. Okay. So in the same regard, I'm full of joy with my grandson and granddaughter-in-law and the girls. Uh, with that, with basically Peyton not being in school, uh, Alyssa and Shane put together a father-daughter dance for Peyton. And Alyssa filmed it. And they got paid, she got Peyton all dressed up, new dress, curl her hair, <laughs> put a nice bar in her hair. 
big bald fingernails, <laughs> you know, the whole nine yards. And um, she had an aqua colored dress on, and Shane had an aqua colored shirt on, and they played music and they danced. It was so sweet. It was so sweet. <laughs> what a wonderful time. Okay. Yes, sir. That's right. I'd like to encourage for myself. Uh, Thursday, I'm going to get my right knee replaced. So I, I've had several surgeries in my life, but I'm really dreading this one. I think mostly because I'm not going to be able to drive for three or four weeks. And, uh, but I'd just like some prayers that it's successful and things go well. Okay. I expect to hear bionic noises from you, though, every time you walk in from now on. <laughs> <laughs> some prayers for myself and my mother on Tuesday where uh, I'm going to uh, take power of attorney from her that day and her memory is such that I don't think she remembers that I told her that this is going to happen so if we can pray that everything goes smoothly with the neurologist and with the paperwork that would be appreciated And I'll ask for prayers for Dawn, because not only is she dealing with that stress, she's dealing with normal work stress, and she's back at school, so she has finals that she's doing this week, so pile it on. I'd also like prayers for my and our Madison. She's um, going to be going to the doctor here soon. She's having some neurology issues, so hopefully they'll be able to figure out what these headaches are caused from, and what exactly is going on. Okay. So, <clears throat> she's really young. She's having all those issues, I think. All right, let's be in a time of prayer. <clears throat> O Lord, you are our light and our salvation. You are the stronghold of our life. We come to this place of meeting to offer up our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We will sing your praises and make melody with our hearts and voices as we give glory to your holy name. Through your blessed Son, we know our citizenship to be in heaven. Still we live as if our own pleasures were all that mattered. You have promised to transform us to glory, but our minds are set on earthly things. Our faithlessness leads us to reject your gracious offer to shelter us, and we dishonor you. Do not turn away your servants in anger. Wipe away our sin and restore us again. By the power of your spirit, give us strength and wisdom to walk in your level path. Inspire us to prevail over false witnesses that by our work all may see your goodness in the land of the living. 
As you have stood with your servants, so now stand with those whom we have named before you. Give courage to those who are falsely accused. Give strength to all who have fallen to illness of body, mind, or spirit. Give hope to the discouraged and peace to those who are dying this day. As a hen shelters her chicks, so give refuge to those who call upon you for help. Hear us, O Lord. Be gracious and answer us. As we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join now in singing hymn number 452, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My faith looks up That's not it. At the disc, it says it has a parenthesis after the song title showing the hymn number. 
Our scripture reading today comes from the Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, 17 through 4, 1. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping, as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our commonwealth is in heaven, from which also we eagerly, eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. The word of God for the people of God. Will you please join with me in the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, um, growing up in the Catholic Church, uh, Lent was always a season of giving up something. Uh, usually it was something that we liked, something that well, we liked that we considered bad for us. Or, if you were like my dad, you gave up something you never partook in anyway, which was water skiing and watermelon. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was never uh, really clearly explained to me why. I mean, it was kind of hinted that, you know, you, you need to you need to suffer a little bit during this time like Christ suffered. And I'm like, all right, well, whatever. And then, there, and then in the end, it was always, you know what, just do it. And as time went by and as I grew older and then I studied a little more and went off to seminary, I discovered that Lent was just more than just giving up something or not having meat on Fridays. Which fish doesn't count. I guess fish isn't a meat. <laughs> and neither is pizza, by the way, as long as you don't have pepperoni or something like that. But I, I came to see it as a season of uh, self-analysis and reflection. You know, that this is a time for us to focus on our own weaknesses and our failures, not to self-punish, but to kind of see those areas where growth opportunities are. To reprioritize our life. And to give us the time to work on it long enough that it becomes a new habit. It's interesting, you know, these, these 40 days of Lent, and that number 40 always shows up in the scripture. And it's just one of those numbers that kind of means... Um, it's not that it was a specific time, it was just, uh, it was a sufficient time for whatever to happen, happen. So they wandered 40 years in the wilderness, not because it was exactly 40 years, but because it was a sufficient time for God's promise that one generation would, would not pass into the land. And historically, uh, this kind of self-reflection and self-analysis and stuff has been taken too far. 
It has given birth to, to behaviors and whole schools of thought. Uh, asceticism comes to mind. Uh, this is a, a school of thought that says that anything that is worldly in, in giving pleasure is bad and evil. Uh, and if you've ever heard of um, punishing the flesh or self-flagellation where people will whip themselves, I mean, there are whole creative ways that people would remind themselves, oh, that this flesh, this body is a bad and terrible thing. And so they would live a life in pain just to remind them of that. And they will use scriptures like today's to, to justify that behavior. When, when Paul says, you know, that there are, there are many out there whose end is destruction and whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who sets, set their mind on earthly things, they'll use those things to say, oh, those are terrible things and we should never ever enjoy them. And I think the idea of that is itself a sin. That the idea that our bodies are corrupt, that we are doomed to hell just because we were born, is a complete obliteration of the fact that we are created in God's image. That God knew us and knit us together in our mother's womb. And that God went to an, an extreme action to make sure that humans stayed human. If you look at the scripture in, in, in Eden, when we talk about, oh, they were cast out because they sinned. If you read that text, they weren't cast out because they sinned. They cast out because they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and therefore became like God in that way. And God says... See, therefore, they might also take from the tree of life and become like us. And so he cast them out. And so the point was to keep them human. Indicating that the idea that the knowledge of good and evil combined with everlasting life makes someone divine. And also, God had a lie. If, if they had remained in the garden... Paul said that. Paul said the wages of sin is death. God said, see, they, they might also take from the tree of life. And so he cast them out. So it's, God went to a, to a huge extreme in order to keep us human. There must be something important about it. And to say that our bodies are corrupt is, I just think... A terrible, terrible thing that leads people to do terrible, terrible things to themselves and to others. And I think the hint that gives us in here, especially in this section that Paul uses when he says, whose God is their belly. I mean, these things happen. And I say this often. Uh, and especially with my atheist friends, they, they get upset when I say it, but, I'm gonna, but I still hold to it. Everybody, everybody has a God. There is something out there in the world that informs their behavior and their morals. And if you want to know what that is for yourself sometime, this is, this is a, something I, when I first heard it, I went, wow, that's very interesting. If you want to know what your priorities are, take a look at your checkbook. So that, that God takes many forms. Maybe it's money. Which is why I really hate the fact that our money says in God we trust on it. Because you're actually looking at money and naming it God. Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's just pleasure in general. Maybe it's ego. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's escapism. And if, when I, I just, I have to say this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to offend somebody. You're, you're going to be offended. I'm just going to say that right now. 
Oh. This one, this one was literally right out of scripture this week. So I don't know if you saw that um, there is a group called CPAC, the uh, Conservative Political Action Conference. They literally had a golden statue of Trump. Yeah, it's it's the new golden calf. I mean, it's right there. Oh, I mean, holy cow is right. The golden calf, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you didn't recognize that, I don't know what to say. I mean, if you are, that is a group of people whose god is politics. And and look, we we need certain things. You know, we need to eat. It's a it's a fact of life. We need joy in our lives. And we need, you know, this is why I love Coalette, who's always kind of tempering the extremes. When he goes, look, you get one life. Why don't you enjoy it while you're here? You know, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Eat, drink, be merry. That's literally scriptural. But when it becomes our God, that's when it becomes dangerous. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul's goal is not to drive us to asceticism and self-punishment and just abandoning every positive or good thing we might enjoy in this world. Paul's trying to tell us to check our motivation throughout this whole letter. In the very beginning of the letter, in chapter 1, verses uh, 15 to 17, he's talking about his imprisonment, how he keeps talking about the gospel of Christ while he's there. And he says this, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also, some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. I don't I don't think I really need to point out that there are plenty of people, especially on TV and on the radio, who preach Christ out of selfish ambition. There's a long history of televangelists who have proven that time and time again. And then he gives a warning in chapter 2, verses 3, four, three and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. And that's what he's doing. Check your motivation. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? There is this modern tendency that drives me bananas. Just bananas. The, to, to, this tendency to self-justify. And to seek only those things and those thoughts that tell us, hey, we're perfect. We are great, just the way we are. And if you don't, and if you disagree, then you're nothing to me and you are free to leave. And the reality is. We are not free to leave. We all live together in this place. All of us. Our actions have consequences on everyone around us. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's taught us that. One way or another, we are still neighbors. Even more so in this digital age. Where we can reach out literally across the world on social media and influence each other. And so Paul is, is reiterating that old Deuteronomic choice 
that's set before us. What are, what are your goals? What are your motivations? Are you driven for, by earthly things, by hunger and destruction and glorying and shame or attention or fame or whatever it is? Or are you driven by the commonwealth of heaven? And I love that word, commonwealth. Just think about what it means in its two root words, commonwealth. That which is shared by everybody. Our humanity, our world, our food. Back to 2, 30, 2 verses 3 and 4. He follows that do nothing from, self, uh, from selfishness or empty conceit with, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. There is nothing corrupt about our bodies. There is nothing inherently evil about enjoying good food and good things in life. That's, that has never, ever, in my opinion, been taught in Scripture. What has been taught is the degree to which we partake of those things and the motivation behind them. Is it out of selfishness or out of love of neighbor? Is it because we are set on earthly goals or because we're set on the commonwealth of heaven? And this is what Paul urges us to stand firm in, in love and in community, not in selfish ambition or our own pleasures. And so if you've given something up for Lent or not, if you've made any steps to self-discipline or to change a habit or whatever it might be. Reflect on why you do what you do. And when you come out on the other side of Lent, the goal will to be a better human being and a better Christian. Amen. Amen. Join in singing our closing hymn, number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <laughs> Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix on us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies frown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love our heart. Visit us with thy salvation, and turn every trembling heart. Breathe, oh, breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit and find that second rest. Take away our bent to sinning. Help us And of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy
thy temple see, thee we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy hosts above, pray and praise thee without ceasing glory in thy perfect love. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Go now in the peace and love of Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God the Father. Take this time, this time of Lent, to self-reflect and to see what your motivations are and change those motivations that need to be moved to the commonwealth of heaven and away from selfishness. Amen. <laughs>